Some birds are arsonists, as in they spread fire on purpose. That's what an arsonist is. These birds are collectively known as firehawks, which is awesome. And they include the black kite, the whistling kite, and the brown falcon. This behavior was first described by multiple native observers. They saw the birds making numerous trips, carrying burning sticks in their talons or beaks. But other scientists believe these birds spread fire by accident. It turns out though, the firehawks are wigged arsonists. You see, spreading wildfires or human-made fires gives the birds a great opportunity to flush out prey with the fire and smoke. And these avian arsonists can spread fire up to a kilometer away and all this happens in Australia's tropical savanna where firefighters have to keep an eye out for both wildfires and the firehawks who spread them. Want to see a neat physics demonstration? When not moving, this chain behaves as expected. But when it's spun up using a motor, it gains momentum and behaves rather unexpectedly. And when it's knocked off the motor, Physics is fun. In this video, I'm going to try turning this penny into gold, which is something that I've always wanted to do. The first step is to clean the penny, and all I need is some vinegar and some salt. As it sits there, the oxides are getting slowly removed, and while I wait for that to happen, I'll get something else ready. For this mixture, I'll start with some water, and I need to dissolve some sodium hydroxide drain cleaner. When this is all gone, I just have to dump in some zinc metal and turn on the hot plate, and that's basically it. Now, coming back to the penny, it's looking pretty good, and I'll just quickly wash it off and drop it into the zinc mixture. As it sits there, the penny is slowly getting coated with zinc metal. It's now been about 20 minutes, and it looks like it's been completely covered. What I have now is a completely silver penny, which I think is pretty cool. I still think gold is better though, so I dropped it onto a hot plate and cranked up the heat. As it warms up, it slowly changes color, and eventually, it's completely gold. Unfortunately though, even if it really looks like it, it isn't real gold. It's actually brass, and it formed because the heat caused the zinc coating to combine with the copper in the penny. Just for fun, I decided to make a whole bunch more, but I have no idea what to do with them. It's time for the experiment that you asked for. Last week, I removed the old carpet and exposed the beautiful hardwood, but there was a problem. After scraping row by row to get that padding off, there was adhesive everywhere and it's super hard to get off. I thought it'd be fun to test out a few different things I saw in the comments. Some were commented many times and others, well, only once, but I guess for science. And since we're talking science, I'm using a standard cleaner Olivia and I use as a control. This was the most even spot on the floor, so I separated it into four quadrants. Quadrant number one was Goo Gone. Quadrant number two was Murphy's, which I had to mix with water, so I put in a spray bottle and used that. Now this was the weird one, but a lot of people seemed interested, so quadrant number three, Diet Pepsi. I let it soak into some paper towels because I really didn't want to soak the floor. Quadrant four was seventh generation, which I used the spray and the wipes. I'm going to let them sit for an equal amount of time, but which one do you think will do the best? 
These are the Squid Game cookies, and today we're gonna be testing out which method is the quickest. We're gonna be using the fire needle, the regular needle, breaking it apart and licking it. Let's go. So first up, I'm gonna be using the needle. Now, this one took me a little bit longer than I thought. Now, although this didn't feel like it helped a lot, it did feel like it helped by making sure that when I did break it with my hands that it didn't completely shatter, but I really don't think it was that effective. And it took me around two minutes and 15 seconds to complete this, and it ended up coming out pretty clean, but I still don't think the needle helped that much. Now we're gonna be using the needle that's heated up, just like they used the lighter in the show. And this is a lot different than I thought it would be. Basically, the second you put the needle through the cookie, it instantly cools down. So it creates one hole, but after that, it's completely useless. So what I ended up doing is creating a bunch of holes all along the rim. So that way, when I did break it up, it was like a little bit easier and it had more stress points. So overall, I don't think this was this effective. And plus it took me like almost four minutes to do this. So I would give this one not a good rating. All right, and now I'm gonna be doing the original method, which is just breaking it with my hands. This ended up being a lot quicker than I thought. And what I realized is when the cookie is really thin, it's really easy to break. And even though it's thick, it's still pretty easy to break. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that this one took me 30 seconds and it was really easy. So I'm gonna go ahead and say this one's probably one of the best. And finally, I'm gonna be testing the licking technique. All right, in three, two, one. Right. Oh my God. Oh. If I had like 10 minutes and I would die, I'm dead. Oh my gosh. Putting up the light, I can see through it a little bit. I, it's been one minute and I don't think I'm any closer at all. If the cookie was so thin that I can lick through it, then most likely it would be so thin that I can just break it just like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and myth bust this because this licking is gonna take literally forever. Not, it's just not gonna work. I, at, at this point, if it's that thin that I can lick through it, then it would just easily snap off as it's doing. Okay. And yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. So it looks like there's no way you can lick through this because if it was that thin, you just snap it. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that this is probably the worst technique. So I have a security tag and I have tin foil. I'm gonna walk with it. Okay. Wrap, security tag, and tin foil. Psychologists have known for years that there's no distal tephra to even show that there was an explosion of Pompeii's volcano in 79 AD. Saying that ancient Rome doesn't exist is one thing. Saying that Pompeii wasn't a Roman settlement is another. But saying that Pompeii wasn't destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius has got to be the most blatant lie you've said so far. What she's saying is that there's no evidence of volcanic material at Pompeii or Herculaneum, which is just wrong? The cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. I never thought I was going to have to defend this, but here we are. Firstly, there are primary documents written by people who were actually there. The most famous of these being the writings of Pliny the Younger, who recounted his horror as he watched Mount Vesuvius erupt from across the Bay of Naples. But I guess if an eyewitness account isn't enough for you, let's take a look at that geology you say doesn't exist. The entire site of Pompeii is buried in between 15 and 20 feet of volcanic ash. This deposition layer occurred as the side of Vesuvius itself exploded, resulting in a superheated landslide of mud and ash called a pyroclastic flow. This is why we find carbonized food still present in the city. We have not uncovered any more of Pompeii really since the original digging out. Why do you think we are uncovering it and digging it out? Because it was buried. This is just wrong. There are very much still ongoing excavations at Pompeii, but you wouldn't want to talk about that because then you'd have to 
to show off the Latin inscriptions on the buried buildings, and then you'd have to admit that Latin wasn't invented by the church in the 1500s like you say it was. And finally, the most important piece of this evidence. And I want to give a little bit of a content warning here, because it gets a little grim. Donna, Pompeii is estimated to have been inhabited by around 12,000 people. In the excavations which have taken place there, they have found the remains of 1,200 men, women, and children. And while they may be gone, their remains are still here to tell you what happened to them. There are remains of people shielding their faces as toxic smoke and gas melted their lungs. There are groups huddled together contorted in their final moments of agony, and mothers who even now, thousands of years later, are still holding their children in a final attempt to protect them from the inevitable. Donna, they have found the remains of people who met their end because the heat from the pyroclastic flow was so great that their brains boiled and their skulls exploded. When you rewrite history like this, you not only spread misinformation, but you erase the horror that these people experienced. I know that this was nearly 2,000 years ago, but these people were exactly like you and I. So please treat them with some respect. You know, I'm actually quite excited because in my upcoming YouTube video where me and the rest of archaeology TikTok break down this conspiracy, I not only have a PhD, two doctors, and a whole host of students who all want to give you a run for their money, but I also have someone who has quite literally participated in the excavations at Pompeii. I'm sure they're going to have a lot to say to you. For all of you who are now following this Arc Talk boss battle, uh, don't engage with Donna. And if you are going to say something, please be kind about it. We are not here to harass people. Remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive, and most importantly, don't stop fighting for the truth. You got a friend in me.